This is Teachers Talk Radio, and you are listening live. Hello and welcome to a very sunny Friday afternoon on Friday the 4th of August. My name is James Rabin, and tonight I'm going to be joining some excellent guests, Dr Fiona Aubrey-Smith and Graham McCauley, as we go and explore what EdTech is and how that can transform education. This is Teachers Talk Radio, and you are listening live. Tune in live at ttradio.org, or to join in the conversation, download the Podbean app and search Teachers Talk Radio. Follow the hashtag TT Radio. Tune in, talk it out with Teachers Talk Radio. Hello and welcome to The Late Show with me, your host, James Rabham. Tonight, we're going to dive into the fascinating world of education technology, commonly known as EdTech. Today, we are going to explore the profound impact of EdTech on the modern education and how it is reshaping teaching and the learning landscape. Education technology, or uh, EdTech, often as we refer to it, often talks about those tools, that software, the platforms and the education processes to engage students, to collaborate um, and support that learning outcomes. And from the boom of the interactive whiteboards in the 2000s and the education apps to virtual reality systems and online learning platforms through COVID, EdTech encompasses a wide range of innovation tools that are revolutioning the way we teach and the way we learn and and uh, actually deliver the curriculum as well as how we organize it. But it is a bit of a paradox. And technology is generally considered as a taller system. And as we hear from our guests this evening, we're going to explore this concept in more depth. Joining us today, there are two distinguished experts who have dedicated their careers to exploring um, the evidence and possibilities of edtech in schools. First, we have Dr. Fiona Aubrey-Smith, an esteemed researcher and consultant who has extensively worked with various schools, multi-academy trusts, examining the effectiveness of education implementation and its impact on student achievement. Our second guest, none other than Graham McCauley, the Director of Innovation and Growth at Leo Academy Trust, with a passion for driving innovation and leveling technology to empower both educators and students. Graham brings a wealth of experience in leading successful education edtech initiatives. And together, both of them are going to get and feel the potential what edtech can do to transform education. We're going to discuss these best practices, share the real world stories, and explore the future of technology enhanced learning. So, if you're curious about edtech in reshaping classrooms and empowering educators, tune in to this exciting episode of Teacher Talk Radio and prepare to be inspired by the possibilities of education technology. And let's learn and grow together. If you have any questions, don't hesitate to join in with the conversation live on Podbeam or tweet us using the hashtag TT Radio at TT Radio Official and also my hashtag um, and my username on Twitter, Mr. Rab Byrne. Welcome both and thank you for having on a Friday night. How are you, Fiona? Yeah, great. Thank you very much, Jame. And uh, thank you for having us on the show tonight. It's a privilege to be part of the conversation. Excellent. I know uh, Graham's got a little bit of issues getting on at the moment, so we're going to get started. And we're going to talk about one of the key things um, that I always ask my guests is, can you just introduce yourself to our listeners and then tell us about that journey through education and your roles that you have done so far um, about that? And so we all understand that from that perspective. That contest. Yeah, of course. Thank you so much. So um, I'm a, a classroom teacher and school leader by trade, as it were. That's how I began um, in education. But actually, I went into teaching because I really wanted to learn. I actually um, trained to become a teacher because I wanted to conduct classroom research. I was fascinated by what is it that makes learning really effective in the classroom and why isn't that happening in every single classroom for every single child? So everything I've done since those sort of early days of teaching and leadership is 
has really been about that. And some of that time has been spent um, as a local authority based um, advisor and as a national advisor for um, uh, an industry based technology company. And I've had various roles in sort of large national and international um, organizations supporting schools and groups of schools. But now I work in a really, really exciting and interesting space where some of my work as an independent um, consultant is directly with schools and in classrooms with teachers, really walking through these journeys together. Some of my work is with um, those who work with schools, so professional learning providers, ed tech companies, um, publishers, organisations like that that are there to support and serve those schools. And then some of my work with my academic hat on um, is uh, teaching and supervising on uh, postgraduate research programs. So I've got this really lovely treat of a role that's a fusion of schools and uh, and suppliers um, and academia that really kind of challenges the thinking in each of those spaces and hopefully enhances you know what comes out of it as a result. So it's a huge privilege of a role and one that I'd highly recommend, James. That sounds fascinating um, in terms of that whole journey you've been on, being able to talk and decipher from different stakeholders at different levels and now on this academia side as well. And I think that's a really fascinating approach to it. Um, and one of the questions always start as well as looking at that journey is always you've got a purpose. Everyone's got a purpose about why they are in education. And what is their passion? Because there's something that drives all of us. So what's your purpose and why do you want to work in education and continue that good fight? Absolutely. And it's it's a really great question because I think that really challenges us all to ask why um, on a day to day basis, as well as that sort of bigger picture. And my why is just that I feel very deeply passionate about making sure that every single learner and I use that word rather than child because learner can be a, a very young child through to um, you know adults of all ages and stages and everyone in between but for every single learner to be able to access any learning opportunity that they want to be able to access and moreover for those opportunities to be visible to every single learner because we only know to access what we know exists right um so that's the deep driver for me and i'm determined to play my little part in breaking down some of the barriers that are in front of learners of all ages and stages today whether that's location educated capacity um you know knowledge um all kinds of different um hurdles that that learners all around the world face um and i think if we can each play some small part in breaking down those barriers, hurdling over the barriers, maybe, then we hopefully will leave the world in a better place than we started. James, can I ask that same question back to you? Um, wow, okay. Um, passion for education. So I always worked with children. So whether I was secondary or A level, um, I was always in like youth bands with music, and then taking that on and leading it. And I think I remember sat on a Sunday night um, leading a session uh, with quite a few adults in there who knew what they were doing and then uh, all these teenagers and younger. And I just could see the path that I was trying to lead these children on mm. and an enlightening opportunity. And it was just fascinating to see what I planned actually worked in some ways. And then I organised an event because I want to showcase all the great work we're doing, whether it's art or music and everything else. And I did all the hard work organizing it and giving ownership to different bits and people. But what I found difficult at that point, and not difficult, but what I wanted to do at that point was step back and see them thrive. Because I said, Do you want to host it? And I was like, No, this is this is other people's opportunity to thrive and shine. And I think that's something that I've always wanted to do within my career in some ways. I, I like a little bit of music, like a little bit, I, I like all these little bits, but having those conversations on a deep level with children, enjoying those conversations and seeing them thrive is fascinating. And my role now has moved more into the school improvement side of it. And I could see a potential of the use of technology in particular, because I'm the digital innovator for our trust. And I find that absolutely fascinating now doing the same work with teachers because I know once they've got something, that's going to be empowering them to influence another 30 children or another 60 and across their school as well. 
Um, so I, I still teach in the classroom, still do team teaching, but now I have the opportunity to work with teachers and leaders directly and um, on other things nationally, and it's fascinating to see that influence as well. And I like almost, I, I like it to be in a conductor in the classroom. I can see all these moving parts. Who can I am I going to give first chair to? Who am I going to actually give the base notes to and let that actually rhythm and that deep thinking drive what we're going to do and make sure that we're all on the same path in the same way. And I like that role of a conductor because, yes, they are the front and forefront, but I like to step back and just let everyone shine in some ways. Um, I've never been asked that question in such a way. <laughs> I have never think I've done that. So I, I like that. That's, that's great. Um, so thank love, you for that as well. <laughs> I love that metaphor of the orchestra as well. I don't think I'm going to be watching an orchestra and the bass players in the same way ever again now. I think that's fantastic. And it's it's absolutely right, isn't it, as a metaphor? Everyone playing their part to bring together this brilliant landscape where we know learners and learning can flourish. I love that, James. Brilliant. Excellent. Now, I'm hoping we have got Graham McCauley, who is here as well. Good evening, Graham. How are you? It's not bad at all. Not bad at all. Uh, lovely to, you know, be here with you, Fiona and James. Brilliant. Brilliant. Um, I know our paths cross like in the outer world of the internet. Can't, I don't know if we can call it Twitter anymore. Um, I'm not sure actually what, what it is, um, is the current phrases for this. But one of the first two questions I asked um, Fiona, Graham, and I want you to do the same is, can you introduce you, your role, um, and what, how your journey through education as well? Uh, yeah. What, what, a, what a question. So uh, I work for Lear Academy Trust. Uh, we're a trust uh, serving around 5,000 pupils in Surrey and South London. Um, and I lead up our innovation work, which is about how as an organisation we think differently to solve problems. Um, and I realise that's probably really vague, actually. What does that really mean in reality? Um, but it is exactly that. It's about thinking differently and helping uh, everybody across the organisation to, to think slightly differently. Um, as, as we grow and develop as an organisation. Um, I started a career probably in a very, very similar way to lots of people. Went to uni, did my undergraduate, did my uh, undergraduate with QTS. Um, and I think probably when I was at uni, by that point, I was already, already really interested in the role that technology had in the classroom. But like many people, probably wasn't in the right place physically, probably wasn't also didn't have a ne sort of necessary knowledge to necessarily act on it. So whilst I, I felt that there was a real space for that, I probably didn't really do an awful lot with that or, or make that a priority for, an, for a number of years. Um, I then left uh, university, went to a school uh, that was really, really um, interested in the role that technology had and interested in how uh, this was a one-to-one -one iPads there, but I think the device is actually irrelevant, but they were one-to-one -one and uh, that was really, really impactful. And... Uh, we were really, really successful about what we achieved then. We rolled out devices and we started to sort of shift the narrative and dialogue about pedagogy uh, and what that means. Uh, I then had been there for a while and like lots of people, I think in education, I probably kind of enjoyed my time there, but was was up for a new challenge, up for new people, different schools, different environments, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so uh, at that point joined Leo and this must be, around six years ago now um, with the focus on really developing teaching and learning with a focus on technology but predominantly focusing on teaching and learning um, and technology was definitely the, the side bit and that still is the case today actually our kind of our pedagogy our teaching and learning is is sort of center position really um, and here I am so obviously support our schools a lot but also do a lot of kind of external uh, work kind of thought leadership pieces and just trying to help trust those really in, in kind of you know moving forward really excellent and um, before we talk about what ed tech and this ped tech idea is um, and as you raise this idea of teaching and learning in particular um one question fiona i asked fiona and then fiona threw it back at me as well was what's your purpose graham what inspired you to work in education I heard you both answer. I was sat there thinking, I really hope I don't get asked that question because I'm not sure what my answer is. And now here I am in the moment of thinking of it. Um, I think, I think probably when I was a child, um, 
my own experiences of, of education generally were really positive, especially the younger I was. And I think possibly subliminally, I'm, I'm aware of that now. And actually, that's possibly what's what inspired me. So perhaps the teachers that I had in the school that I went to and the, the kind of environment that I was in. Um, I've, I've always, a bit like you were saying, James, really, I suppose I'm quite passionate about developing people and recognising that actually, you know, education is like the building blocks that we all need in life, whether that be, you know, a nursery child picking up their first pencil, writing their first word, saying their first name type stuff, whether that's kind of, you know, doctorate level, professorships, etc. Like, well, it doesn't matter where you're on that spectrum. Education is really, really important. And I think I was really... And I, and I still am, actually, to be fair. I was, I, I, I was and I am really passionate about, you know, everybody in society having the core skills that they need to, to not just survive, but to, to thrive and to flourish. Um, and of course, uh, you know, there's lots of ways that, that I think that people develop those skills. But actually, for me, I think working in a primary school and now working in a trusted primary school is a really, really nice way Um you know, and I, I reflect back and think about where, what are those year sixes that leave us age 11? Like, what are the experiences that they've had? How have we prepared them for, you know, not just year seven, but society and the world beyond? So I suppose it's about giving giving people, uh, you know, the very best starts in life. Excellent. And talking about those core cool skills, we're definitely going to come back to that because something with technology is that it's constantly evolving and developing and what is out there in the world now won't be the same in six months' time. And all you have to do is look at the revolution that we've had with Gentive AI and what was released to the world last November um, as a thought process and going through it to where we are now, less than 12 months on, and how many different apps and different processes there are out there and how governments even get involved in banning things and not banning things and putting policies in place and technology is a constant evolving thing and i know we're going to get on to this idea of actually the pedagogical side of it in a bit but in the context of this episode at this moment in time in this point of time and space as you go through it um what is ed tech fiona what would you say ed tech is mm, great question so for me ed tech is uh, is a kind of umbrella term and it's something I would use to describe all kinds of different digital tools and features and objects that can be used for educational purposes. And I use the term educational purposes in a really broad way, actually, because, yes, of course, under that is teaching and learning. But actually, education is more than teaching and learning. Pedagogy is more than teaching and learning. It's about how we structure our school systems and how we organize our days in education, you know, that we go to school between, say, you know, nine and three or whatever the hours might be, that we learn with particular people, we might have one educator to um, 35 children, or you know, whatever those things are, that's about educational choice and decision making, and that will be different all over the world. Um, you know, a, a learning experience, a classroom, a school means something very different um, in England or Scotland, as it do in France or Italy or India or Nepal or you know wherever we might be so when we say education technology ed tech part of that is about the technology and those nuts and bolts tools that we can buy or download or whatever and part of that is about the educational system that that works in so long-winded answer but for me it's very much about the the what we're using it and to a certain extent the how we're using it and I know we'll come on to the, the why part of that a later on. Excellent. Graham, have you got anything to add to that in terms of your role within the classroom at the moment? No, I think I think I've probably got a, a fairly uh, similar thought on it to Fiona, really. I, I guess for me, EdTech is 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 the big the big picture of almost everything that's in that in that recipe, everything that's in that school environment. So yes, you know interactive whiteboards and one-to-one -one devices and tablets and stuff, but also all of the, the, the wider technical bits and pieces. I think I would classify as mm -hmm. tech, so things like our MIS system and our finance system and our payroll system and the system we use for communicating with parents and signing up for trips and all of those weird and wonderful and really exciting things that have mm -hmm. to happen um, are, 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 for me, are all part of that, that ed tech because it's that kind of technical piece that is needed to make a school run. Um, 
and I think that part of the challenge, and we'll we'll come on to this no doubt, is about actually the kind of the why and the, and the thinking behind it. Whereas for me, ed tech is more about not necessarily the thinking about the why, but just the, the what what have we got? What do we use? Uh, what you know? Uh, what's the equipment you know used for? Um, but yeah, that 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 big picture, everything in the school ecosystem. Can I just add something to what Graham said? Because he's he's put it far more eloquently than I did. That kind of ecosystem of stuff that we use um, in school. I think there's a whole load of assumptions in there that we perhaps haven't made that are haven't made um, explicit that really important. Like that, the infrastructure, the budgets that sit behind that, the connectivity, the broadband, the electricity, even. Um, and we take a lot of these things for granted, but actually they are the nut and bolts that make edtech possible in that space. Don't you feel like anything with a plug, they come to you with a problem? <laughs> um, often refer to it in that. And I, same face, similar to you, Fiona, I think about it in terms of um, the tools and then the systems. And they are two separate entities, but as Graham said, everyone has to be involved. And it goes beyond when I go into a lot of schools and I, I do do some computing work as well on the side. Anything technology wise then goes to a computer coordinator it goes down to one person well actually this is a job of a trust or, or an academy or in a school this actually every stakeholder has to be involved within this process and i know the dfe has started to look at putting things into place and looking at strategies and all of this but i think that's another question and another topic for another time almost mm. i kind of want to today as we were saying let's let's talk about the why um, and what it could look like and some of the challenges that we can overcome because those intricacies of how you do it with an iPad or the Chromebook, actually, it doesn't matter what device at the end of the day, it's this thinking in the background is more powerful. So then a really almost simple but quite complex question, and we're going to dive into um, this in a little bit more, um, is does technology actually have a place in the classroom? Because we have schools across not only our trust, but across the country who have one-to-one -one devices. Brilliant. Some schools have a collection of aging devices that they got from the DFE during COVID. And now they're three years old and they're starting to break. They're cheap. They weren't effective. And they haven't really integrated that into the curriculum, which I know something Graham talked about earlier. They haven't got those core skills. So does technology have a place in the classroom then, Fiona? Mm. So that's a really, really interesting question because it's it's a good one to ask. It's being asked by all kinds of people in all kinds of places. But I'm going to be a bit devil's advocate actually about it because if we replace that word technology with the word pencil or book or chair or table or even teacher, then actually we're unpacking a really fascinating thing because people often ask, okay, we've got technology in schools, but but what's the impact of that? I say, okay. Let's just flip that question around and say, what's the impact of a teacher in the classroom? The impact isn't the teacher physically being in the classroom, is it? It isn't the, the, the human body that the teacher brings into the classroom. It's, it's what they do and how they do it and the intricate detail about the way in which they go about their role. It's the approach, the process, it's the thinking behind it all. And I think therefore it's, it's, it's possibly much healthier to think of technology in that same way as well. So does technology have in the, a, a place in the classroom? Absolutely, of course it does, but only, only if it's being used in, in, in an intelligent, professional, purposeful, clearly driven way that we know will make an impact on learning. If it's just there for novelty factor or so-called engagement, then, then no, it's not a worthwhile investment then because engagement should be a starting point for every learner in every lesson, not a kind of nice to have novel thing that learners are somehow privileged to access sometimes so i think it's a much more complex question um, than it first appears and so graham you talked about this idea of pedagogy and school improvement um earlier so how then do we move away from talking about technology into the classroom then and its role within this idea of school improvement then yeah, I mean, it's it's difficult, and I think it's it's fair to say that a number of schools, trusts, academies, colleges, universities, you know, the educational system really struggles with this concept. And I think 
I think in some ways it's quite straightforward, actually. I think in the minute that we stop thinking about and talking about and focusing on and evaluating and every other verb that you can think of, learning is the minute that it all sort of goes wrong. So <laughs> yeah. I think the key is to remain 101% focused on learning. And we could open up a whole can of worms here about what do we mean by learning, but the idea of actually intent and whatever we're intending to achieve. And actually, when we really focus everything on that and when we measure that and when we evaluate that and when we discuss how we're going to improve that, then that happens. It's, it's, it feels really obvious, right? Like, you know, if you go to football practice every Friday, I don't know when football practice is, I'm probably the least football person ever, but if you go to football practice every five o'clock on a Friday and you do that every week, generally you're going to improve, you're going to get better at it. If we, When we talk about learning all the time, every maybe not Friday at five o'clock, but when we talk about learning at every time, then we're going to improve. And I think it's about, it's about like Fiona was sort of, you know, really, you know, really said really well about not not getting distracted and actually staying focused on what's really, really important, setting that vision, setting that kind of sense of purpose. And then and only then once you've got this real sense of direction, then to think about resourcing. And, and like Fiona said, is it a teacher's resource? Is it actually, is it is technology perhaps a potential um, enabler in this space? And, and I, I, th- I think the, the challenge that lots of schools have is that you know, it can appear on the surface to be quite difficult to measure impact and things. And I think that that's, that's part of the challenge about this is that actually sometimes we, we try and look for something that isn't there. And actually when we look at the big picture, we'll see it right in front of us. So long, long answer, I wished it on there about, but effectively let's focus on what's really, really important, like those end goals and not necessarily uh, shift the focus of the dialogue to perhaps some of the, the attributes that might help us to get there. And I think this comes back to the crux of what makes effective teaching and learning. We want to make those children uh, think hard, work hard, and and actually make those changes in the long-term memory. And that's actually the crux of what we're all in education for. Whether you are a director of operations, you're trying to facilitate that through your role in making the systems in the back end for admin or providing the environment that's conclusive of learning. And so therefore, how do all of these things work in that regard? And I know Graham and I, we're very lucky in our role as the directors of innovations. Um, I'm not a director, but um, in that role, working at that level, because there are not many people across the country who are like that and actually have that influence on teaching and learning I know I've heard your teacher and learning lead talk about at Leo um, Academy talk at BET before, and she was fascinating because it's like, actually, this is such a core component that everyone has to be involved in. And when Fiona, you were talking, there was a quote, um, and I don't know if if it actually was Thomas Edison who said this or whether it's chat GPT made it up, <laughs> but I thought it was very apt. So in 1913, this quote it's like all the one, all these quotes about Albert Einstein. Did he say it or did it not? It doesn't really matter because actually, what they the, the point that's made in the quote works. And he said, "Books will soon be obsolete in public schools." And this is 1913. It is um, so. Yeah, it is possible to teach every branch of human knowledge with a motion picture. Out school systems, our school systems will be completely changed inside of ten years. What well, if you think about actually what has changed us? What has forced us? Well, COVID in some ways forced us because what others have realised is the classroom's not four walls. Mm. But mm. who has gone back to those approaches that we've done, we've always done, because those approaches are rooted in teaching and learning. And so therefore, does our thought of using technology to support it, enhance it or transform it or redefine what we're doing, those basic fundamentals are not there yet as well. Um it comes back to a quote that I always, I've always written down for my um, lecture at uni, um, Steve Wheeler, and he said, "Learning first, technology second. Mm-hmm. And he showed us a picture of a barren boat, and he said, "If technology is in the way, that's not going to be conducive to learning. Technology is there to support it, enhance it, or redefine it. Yeah. That's where you can make the biggest difference." Yeah. And it's interesting, isn't it, about when we, we've, we each of us have said in, in our own um, different ways, it's all about focusing on, on learners and learning. But there's an interesting conversation to be had there about what exactly to each of us mean 
by learners and learning. And if you ask the whole profession that question, you will get a wide range of different answers. And therefore, if we are going to use, if we start with the premise of using technology to support learners and learning, what that looks like in practice will reflect the wide variance that we have across the profession about what supporting learners and learning really means. And I think that's why it's really important that we are encouraging ourselves, challenging ourselves and challenging our colleagues to think ever deeper about what we really mean when we're talking about learning. Every day we should be asking ourselves that question, because if we're all thinking, living and breathing it, then we'll keep focusing, as, as Graham was saying, exactly the right things. And that's what you were both leading brilliantly in each of your trusts. You're keeping that attention, keeping that focus on, on learners and learning. And that's why great things are happening. We need to take that as a soundbite, Graham, and send that to our CEOs. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, and I completely get that. And I, I wrote something down then because what's happened within the last five, less than that actually, few years about teaching and learning when we're talking about it in very much umbrella term at the moment is that there are books like the walkthroughs that are really codifying what research says and what it looks like into practice. And as Diddy and William put, these are the best bets. So we know what kind of the foundations are. We know through cognitive science quite concrete of what this could look like, the whys and the hows, but how it looks like in the classroom can there are tweaks and there are certain things. So mm. and I think that's a really interesting scope to go into it. So it leads really nicely into the next question, um, Graham. What has changed most in your practice by incorporating that use of technology into the classroom? Oh, right. How do I, how do I answer that uh, concisely? I, 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 I want to say that actually, in some ways, nothing's changed. Um, and I, I, I appreciate that's probably a strange thing to say. But I, I, I really believe that the, the fundamentals of the fundamentals of, of teaching and learning haven't ultimately changed. And this links quite nicely to what Fiona was saying about what do we mean by learning. Th th those core bits haven't changed. Now, what I what I believe is, is, is really good pedagogy. It's probably different to everybody on this call and indeed listening to this. You know, it's, it's those deep-rooted values that I think are really, really important. And, and, and I think for me, perhaps some of those core values, or in fact, they probably all of them haven't changed because fundamentally... Technology is not going to change, I believe, your your opinion of what makes teaching and learning effective or, or even just what makes, I don't know, what makes um, a, a school or an organisation effective. That changes. But what I think technology has done, though, is it, it's kind of accelerated or it's enhanced some of those fundamentals. And I think probably the one that stands out for me probably most significantly is all around inclusivity inclusive practice individualized learning and i think probably well not probably at all when i started my career uh like many people that probably started teaching around the same sort of time um you know good teaching and learning was was about you know having three different ability groups and having the, the red group and the green group and the yellow group and you know kind of very much differentiation you know teacher directed instruction and assignment of tasks um and and actually, one thing I've seen now is how, in my own practice, but also across Leo, I really feel that children get a really, really inclusive experience because it's it's really in the heart of what we do. It's not a sort of a, you know, this is what we do for a child with an EHCP or this is what we do for a child who's got this challenge or this is what we don't do. But actually, it's just enabled every single child from our highest attaining to our kind of lowest attaining to, to every spectrum, whatever sort of metric you look at, it's enabled those children to be those independent learners. And I think because of that, it's actually meant that, that a lot of our children, you know, I don't, I don't sound like, you know, we don't need teachers because of course we do. They're the most important resource in our school by a country mile but but we, we've enabled children to to be able to draw on the professional expertise of their teacher but also that they are their own teacher as well and children will you know open up a new tab and go and find an article or they'll they'll you know we use google tools but you know the tools are kind of trivial they'll open up google classroom and they'll draw on the waggle what a good one looks like they'll draw on the model writing from last week or from yesterday and i think just to sort of finish this really really quickly is that we've 
not only have have I and have we really developed that inclusive practice, but we've also done that in a way that's really sustainable for teacher to workload and well being. And I think it's really easy, and we do this in the sector so well, to ask people to do more. And I think that that's of course not sustainable because we we all only have so much capacity. But actually, to be able to give that experience and not necessarily increase staff workload exponentially has been really, really effective. Um, so there, there are many things I probably could have shared for that, but I think that's probably the one that sort of, you know, every time I go into a classroom in our school, that's something that I see instantly. And I see in so many different schools, year groups, phases, subjects, it, it, it really feels like it's a, a real strength across the board. And before I ask Fiona the same question, what then are some of those particular things you have done then, Graham, um, those tangible actions that you have made, um, making about your last point, that have supported that work element and that inclusivity element as well? Um, so I, I guess I'll start quite sort of strategically big picture stuff and then perhaps work to some of the more kind of, uh, you know, sort of day-to-day operational. So the first thing, and I think the thing that's most important is we've we've shifted the culture of what of what it means to be an employee in the organization what it means to be a member of staff and we've we, we've invested considerable you know blood sweat tears time effort money in developing people as individual practitioners and i think that that's crucial um you know our commitment to cpd and staff development is is, is really really strong um, as is our coaching model we so we follow a, a model called grand great people uh, developed by chris moyes uh, and that's about actually everyone is a leader in their own environment in their own classroom and actually we're all leading our own professional development and we need support along the way and we need check-ins and stuff but we're all we're all kind of those agents of change so that that culture piece there about saying that we're all on this journey together is absolutely fine to make mistakes is absolutely fine and indeed encouraged to be innovative and to forward thinking and to kind of think differently and i hate the expression but to you know to think outside the box um but that that engine of culture has been crucial what we've also done is we've we've slowly um, but really sort of steadily and in a really sensible way shifted some of our um, previous opinions about what does good learning look like and you know we can come back to learning but you know what does what does you know, does it does it matter if there's learning in a book as a as an example does it does it matter if every children every child in the class has done it slightly differently does it matter if some children have done it digitally and some children have done it on paper you know and 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 all of that has been really really important. Um, and then, and then fired and finally thinking really kind of operationally is about actually we've given, we've given staff the tools that they need to do the job. Um, and by tools, yes, of course, I mean, some of the technical tools as in like we bought the licenses and we've deployed the apps and all that sort of stuff. But also we, we, we've given the, the teachers that, that the mechanisms, the framework, the process systems to, to go in and, and do that. And I think, I think that's really important to, to kind of make the whole system work if rather than just kind of the procurement piece of some sort of ed tech tool. Fascinating. And I think that point you went back to, um, does it matter? Does it matter if it's in books or it's digitally as well? And and it's questioning why we do things. Why are yeah, we doing it this absolutely. way? What's the impact? What's the perceived impact? And what actually is the impact as well? Because we may perceive something to happen and actually the opposite may happen and so it's what i think education in the last few years has made us look into that depth more than we ever have before and if you think back to maths and the mastery curriculum it's that kind of there's an echo there isn't there in some ways we're looking at things in different ways and what i'm going into schools and fascinating is that having those coaching conversations and talk to them okay why are we doing it this way and what can we do Where's the research behind it? What can we, how can we adjust it and going into it? So thinking about that, does it matter then? Um, and being devil's advocate, isn't technology just another fad then? Is there actually, why now we can, um, this idea that children just go on Google, we can Google, it's almost a verb now, we can just go into that and use it that way. Um, and is there time in the curriculum to really do this, Fiona? Do you think there's actually, in this idea of budget constraints and everything else, we'll go on to that in a bit, but isn't technology just a fad to add in and another thing to do? 
Yeah, no, it's a really important. It's a really important. I'm I'm chuckling. Um, I'm chuckling away. There's it. It was a, the thing you said about is there time in the curriculum to do this? And don't you find whatever the world's problems are, the 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 world always says the answer is to teach that in schools, um, as if we've got kind of endless time to fit all kinds of things in. Um, so I think there's two parts to to what I'd say. First of all, is if if we go with the premise that schools exist to support and develop the learning of the young people of today who are going to be employees in the workforce of, of tomorrow, then skills, including digital skills, both sort of computational things, uh, coding, as well as kind of digital um, digital lifestyles, digital literacies, all those sorts of things. Yeah, of course, they're important. You know, that's the nuts and bolts stuff, isn't it, of readiness for tomorrow. But actually, aren't schools more than just about workforce readiness and creating tomorrow's generation? Aren't they also communities of human beings who are living together, who are working together, who are connecting communities together through families and through neighbours, through all kinds of activities, charitable activity, you know, all kinds of things that, that schools do. Now, to do that, to be an effective community, means making inclusivity for every single person, not just an idea or an agenda or, or a jobs list for somebody, but actually making that inclusivity real and meaningful. And that's sort of twofold. First of all, that's about breaking down barriers. And those could be really practical things, um, you know, with like speech to text or, um, or screen layers or dignity um, when asking for some extra support or help or those kinds of things accessibility there's loads of things like this and, and it would be great for graham to share more about some of those things that happen in the classrooms at leo and i know james similarly um in your source as well you know you, you're making this possible for children day in day out but as well as that dig, uh, as well as that inclusivity element building a community is about people working together effectively to support each other so that might be teachers conducting whole class real-time formative assessment in the minute of a lesson in the moment of a lesson in order that they can take the next minute the next five minutes of that lesson forward in a way that responds to the direct needs of the children in the class at that time now to do whole class accurate meaningful real-time formative assessment without digital technology is i don't know i wouldn't want to use the word impossible but extremely difficult Whereas utilising certain types of digital technology, I'm, I'm not going to kind of go into sort of naming products and features necessarily, but there are tools that we can use that do that. And I know both of you have examples from your own schools um, that would be great to, to share with the audience about how that works. Now, if you've got real time, whole class, meaningful, detailed formative assessment, then the adaptive teaching that follows is going to be better and it is going to move children's learning on it is going to increase progress. If you increase, increase progress, you're going to increase attainment. If you increase attainment, you're going to build confidence, you're going to build competence, you're going to create learners who see themselves as learners and who want to learn. Now, that's not just about short term results at the end of a lesson or the term. That's about setting young people up for successful lives, isn't it? So it's short term and longer term. So is technology a fad? Well, if making building communities and making young people feel like learners and creating real meaningful inclusivity. If that's a fad, then technology is a fad. But I think it's all much, much more valuable and meaningful than that. Excellent. Before we go into, Graham, um, some of those concrete ideas about that inclusivity um, in particular, we're going to go quick, listen to the holiday news, and we will come back to Teach Talk Radio about all of this element as well. It's time for a fresh start to language learning. Pearson Edexcel's new student-centred French, German and Spanish 2024 GCSEs cater to the needs of all learners, regardless of their background, ability or reason for studying. Rooted in learned language knowledge, their assessments are transparent and accessible, allowing all students to showcase their language skills. Through inclusive and relatable content, the new Pearson Edexcel MFL GCSEs build a shared cultural capital that helps students develop an understanding of and appreciation for the wider world. Find out more at go.pearson.com forward slash MFL GCSE 24. This is Teachers Talk Radio. 
And this is Teachers Talk Radio News. With exam results looming for students from all four home nations and around the world, Schools Week features an article concentrating on the ongoing impact of the COVID-19 pandemic. The article, written by a head teacher, says we need to continue to consider the additional burden of the pandemic. It reminds us that this year's Year 13s were part of a cohort who didn't sit GCSE exams, and that this year's Year 11s were in Year 8 when lockdowns began, although the start of GCSE was supposed to be a return to normal for these students. Teachers too faced the challenge of a return to normal content, having had it reduced over the last two years. ECTs also needed some increased support in delivering the broader content for a number of GCSEs. Workload for pupils and teachers shifted and perhaps increased as schools tried to find the right balance of support, revision and basic content coverage by often offering after school and holiday intervention sessions. Whatever happens for individuals on results days this year, the ghost of the pandemic, he says, has not disappeared just yet. The Guardian reports on new local government association research, which suggests council-maintained schools in England outperform academies in Ofsted ratings. The research found 93% of council-maintained schools were ranked good or outstanding by Ofsted as of the 31st of January 2023. This compared with 87% of academies that have been graded since they converted. The study also found only 57% of academies that were already an academy in August 2018 managed to improve standards from inadequate or requires improvement to good or outstanding, compared with 73% of council-maintained schools. The research has prompted many to question the evidence for a move away from council-maintained schools. Currently, 80% of secondary schools and 40% of primaries are academies. Councils were last able to open maintained schools in 2012. A Department for Education spokesperson said academy reforms have played a major role in increasing the proportion of good or outstanding schools. Mary Bowstead of the National Education Union said allowing local authorities to open new maintained schools would boost the ability to respond to demographic changes by opening quality provision. Whilst the research has been seen by many as a warning about the risks of government policy on academisation, some have pointed out that because schools who are failing are required to convert to academies, the numbers are always going to be skewed. A report by the Children's Commissioner shows that eating disorders such as bulimia, anorexia and binge eating are on the rise in England. Figures suggest that in the UK an estimated 1.25 million have an eating disorder but that young people under the age of 25 are disproportionately affected. The report points to NHS figures which it says show a large and recent increase in the numbers of hospital admissions for young people due to eating disorders, with almost half being for those under 25. Whilst the large majority of those affected are female, admissions of young men have more than doubled in the period from 2015-16 to 2020-21. However, according to the report, whilst the number of children and young people starting treatment has more than doubled, so have waiting times for the beginning of treatment. Urgent cases now take more than 12 weeks to begin. The report suggests that government need to tackle some of the drivers of disordered eating, including online content and forms of social media. In the USA, the Education Secretary, Miguel Cardona, says the Supreme Court decision to eliminate affirmative action may help to axe legacy and donor-based college admissions. The Guardian covers the story which focuses on the college admissions process across America. The wealthiest Americans, who are overwhelmingly white, benefit disproportionately from college admissions based on familial relations with alumni and school donors. Cardona praised colleges who have already stopped legacy admissions, including Wesleyan University, Johns Hopkins and Massachusetts Institute of Technology. He said these and other schools were making sure they're doing more for diversity than they were doing before the end of affirmative action. He did, however, make his criticism of the decision by the Supreme Court clear when he said that there are brown and black kids who are going to feel like they're not wanted. This has been your Teachers Talk Radio News with Joe Fox. 
Hello and welcome back to Teach Talk Radio. Tonight I have got Fiona and Graham as we explore the world of technology within schools um, and really explore what it could look like and some of those underlying principles behind it. Now, before the break, we were um, talking about this idea of inclusivity. I know when I've talked to schools and when I work in with art, actually being able to personalize that learning and making sure that my teaching can fit the needs for the fast array of requirements within my classroom. Technology can really support that. And one of the most powerful videos that I've ever seen on inclusivity um, is one that was made by Apple. And it really was fascinating how the technology can support those users have a voice and be able to access things just through the tools that they have in front of them. I remember when I started um, my teaching career, um, I was a TA for three months and I was one-to-one with this visually impaired child. And she had this big screen, she had a big scope, had um, printouts of um, the worksheets on big A3 bits of paper. And if anyone came into that classroom, it just pointed out, right, she's different. Well, actually, that's not what she needed. She had a strong world character, which would get her through life. But what she needed was, actually, let's not sing about it. We don't need we don't need to do that. I need to actually have the tools to support through this in this instance. And we can sing about them. We need to sing about the diversity, but we also need to make sure that those tools are there on hand and easy to use as well. So going to you, Graham, then, as I did pre-warn you before the break. um, So what are some of those things you have supported inclusivity within Leo? And what's some of that impact that you have seen as well, not only on the children, but maybe the outcomes and the teachers itself? Yeah, um, really, really good question. And I think I am... Thank, firstly, thanks for the, the warning before the break. That gave me uh, five minutes or so just to really think. And actually, I was initially finding it quite difficult to answer. Actually, and I was thinking, what actually do we do? And I think part of the reason is because we don't consider a lot of the kind of functionality or a lot of the approaches necessarily as being inclusive or kind of like even an inclusion strategy. We just consider it to be really good practice. It's actually just embedded in our teaching and learning strategy at a trust level and therefore our teaching and learning policies, but, you know, more importantly, what goes on in our classrooms every single day. Um, and I think that that kind of links back to what we talked about before, about having those those fundamentals of what teaching and learning is in your organisation, really sticking to that. Um, so I guess the, really the question is probably more about what are some of those really important fundamentals that happen in teaching and learning daily that are really, really inclusive? And, and there's lots of those. So... One that really stands out to me is around voice typing and recognising that actually for a variety of different children for different reasons, actually sometimes just typing isn't isn't the one for them or writing their book just isn't the one. And actually what we really care about is is really good learning. And actually at Leo, we, we don't, you know, we're, we're, not, we're not obsessed with learning looking a certain way or being in a certain format or even being in a certain, like being digital or paper-based. It's about, you know, the learning that happens. And so... Sometimes for some of our children, just children having access to voice typing just embedded onto their device. So it's just like, it's just for, the, for a lot of our children, it's probably just as easy as picking up a pencil. Or in fact, actually, probably sometimes even easier. They don't have to go and find a sharpener or find a pencil or go to another table to find it in the pencil pot. They can just, you know, they, they've got those tools that are almost embedded within them. So voice typing is a really, really nice one. And I've seen that being used in so many different ways really effectively. I've seen it from you know, a child that's um, physically disabled that that can't hold a pencil uh, or a pen or or anything like that to a child that was really dysregulated and actually was was really struggling to kind of engage, but actually taking their device somewhere different, somewhere quiet and sitting and speaking into it. I've seen that really effective. I've also seen it um, used really, really, really effectively for some of our GDS writers where we actually wanted to get them, sorry, GDS, greater depth. We wanted to get those children really focusing on language really, really quickly. So we use voice typing as a like, just use this to get your words down quickly, you know, get your story, get your narrative on 
paper on on digital paper and then we can kind of focus on what we really want to focus on so it kind of in, increasing the, the pace of um their learning so that we can focus on what's really really important and then of course uh you know i i taught in year six at one of our schools uh, until quite recently and a child there that had uh, english as additional language really really lovely child some great ideas but did have huge gaps in his english and whilst we were working really hard to to support him and develop them um, actually sometimes he did just really benefit from not having to worry about the spelling and just use voice typing and let's just really celebrate your ideas and your sequencing and all those sort of things so that's 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 one uh, about voice typing and the creativity that, that can provide and i think with that, and I'm saying with that because the tool that we use really effectively for that also includes some of the other features, but another one is about visual dictionaries. And I think what I really like, again, about the way we use visual dictionaries is it's not about, you know, printing out 10 words and giving a child a picture. It's about actually let's empower this child to use this tool so that that child independently goes, I'm not sure what dilapidated means. Let's use the picture dictionary. Let's use the visual dictionary. Let's use the colourful semantics to tell me, okay, it's an adjective or it's a verb. And then, okay, well, what word makes sense in that? So that's a, another really, really nice one about visual dictionaries and using that to support la uh, language acquisition. Um, another one that I think is really, really important um, to share and um, so I'm trying really hard not to use product names, uh, but you know we use uh, we use a certain tool for this. But I'm sure, as with all of this, it's not about the tool; it's about how you use it. And of course, there's many ways to to, to skin a cat. To a slight expression there, uh, and that's about actually children just having really collaborative environments digitally that they can work on. So actually, you know, here we are. We're gonna, you know, we're writing a balanced argument about I don't know should schools serve i don't know fast food or should we wear uniform or should children be allowed access to the internet and actually by children working to together collaboratively they're able to share their ideas we've removed all the stigma of putting your hand up we've also removed the kind of that cold calling experience i know it's the idea you know comes from rose and Sorry, doesn't it about you know, every child's on their A game, they're on their toes because they don't know who's coming next. But actually, let's create the learning environment in the classroom, really supportive and caring and nurturing, where actually every child will click on a sticky note and share some ideas. Um, and I've seen that in time and time again in loads of different schools, not just Leo schools, where actually by giving children effectively that indirect scaffolding, giving children some support to... Uh, see diff different children's ideas and then build upon it has been really, really effective. Um, they're the ones that probably stand out to me, uh, but there is probably about another 7 million I could share with you. But I think just some really nice ones there that have, have made a real difference, not on our teachers, although, of course, that's really nice, but most importantly, on our children. And and even more important than that, on, the, on that kind of like feeling of what does it feel like to be a child in the, in the classroom, I think that's where it's really had positive impact. Excellent. I, I just wrote something down here that I um, remember I heard, and I don't know where it was from, and we were talking about this inclusivity. And the phrase was, it's necessary for some, but it's useful for all learners. And I think that's, yeah, that's brilliant. Thank you. I knew, I knew one of you would get where that came from. Um, <laughs> it's so true, though, isn't it? So true. Yeah. yeah. And, it's, and I also think, from listening to what you were saying, Graham, I often find that there's a misconception and misconceived idea that technology is just the end outcome. And actually, where does it fit within that learning sequence? Is it a way to gather ideas or scaffolding tool? Is it a way that we can plan out ideas through voice notes? And actually, it's a scientific experiment that needs to be detailed and written up in a certain way. Actually, let's, let's apply that learning within the books. Poetry is meant to be performed. And I know a podcast last week, they were talking about writing, um, in particular Key Stage 2, but it worked across the board. Writing's there for an audience. Technology can support that. It can enhance it. And as Graham and I, we've been talking about this pedagogical idea of teaching and learning. We've linked erosion science. I know, Fiona, that's real, a real passion of yours. So I wondered if there's something there you would want to explore or explain to the audience about this idea of pedagogy and technology um, element. Mm, oh, I'd love to, and thank you for the opportunity to do so. I think um, there's two things that I think are really, really helpful to think about when we talk about pedagogy and technology in the same sentence, in the same conversation. Thing number one 
is pedagogy is not just teaching and learning. In the teaching profession, we tend to use this term pedagogy as a sort of umbrella term um, to mean all kinds of different things. And it can mean pedagogical beliefs, you know, those, those deep values and beliefs that Graham was referring to right at the outset that, that drive our very purpose and being. It can mean pedagogical approaches. So you talked earlier about Tom Sherrington's walkthroughs and the Rosenshine principles and those sorts of things. They are trainable, teachable, replicatable processes, techniques, strategies. It can mean politicised pedagogies. So we know that we are encouraged to teach in particular ways. Take synthetic phonics, for example. It can be um, pedagogical practices, those individual specific actions, you know, the type of question that you ask which learner you look at at a particular moment in time in the lesson, things like that. So we've got beliefs, approaches, politicised practices, four very, very different things, looking at different sort of levels, if you like. Across that, when we think about pedagogy, we've then got different kind of theories of pedagogy, very traditional behaviourist ways of thinking about education, you know, where a teacher is seen as the person who knows everything, who's going to kind of pour that into learners' brains. If they can repeat it back and pass the test, they must have learned hurrah, you know, that kind of um, very behaviorist mindset, right the way through to the other extreme in a very sort of socio-cultural mindset, uh, you know, where we're thinking about communities of practice and learning to belong to different kinds of communities. And of course, in the middle of somewhere, we've got all kinds of different forms of constructivism upon which um, our system in the systems in the UK are mainly based somewhere in the middle around individual constructivism. But the point is, pedagogy is this huge umbrella term that incorporates all of that. Yes, it incorporates what do we mean by being a teacher and what does teaching mean and look like? Yes, it incorporates what do we think it means to be a learner and what does learning really mean in 2023? But it also incorporates ideas around knowledge, like where does knowledge even come from? Who decides that something is a piece of knowledge? Is that one person, a group of experts? Is that socially situated and we kind of ratify the grid together? Does knowledge belong to a particular community of people with a shared view? You know, there's very different ideas around knowledge and therefore, depending on what you think knowledge is and where it comes from, determines how you then validate or verify or confirm that somebody holds or has knowledge. And of course, pedagogy also includes big picture ideas around schooling. What does it mean to go to school? And James, you referred earlier to that kind of post-pandemic thing about it's not the four walls of the building you go to. It's not even necessarily the group of people you're with or who your teacher is. So, you know, no wonder we're having kind of big challenging conversations about the so-called reluctant returners because the whole concept of what it means to go to school has been provoked, you know, into this. So that thing one, what do we actually mean by pedagogy? And as a profession, none of us, myself included, none of us spend enough time thinking and talking about this. I feel deeply passionate about this. Um, I've written a whole book on it because I'm so um, deeply passionate about it. But that leads us into this relationship with technology. Because if we want to use technology to support teaching and learning, or bigger picture, if we want to use technology to support those big pedagogical range of considerations that we need to understand the pedagogy first. And even important than that, we need to make sure that technology is always being informed and led by pedagogical thinking. Because fundamentally, every single t decision made in or about a school is ultimately a pedagogical decision because it will affect choices that can be made by teachers and learners in the moment of learning. And that's what this shift about moving from an ed tech way of thinking about the tools, the what, and about the how we use those tools, the sort of trainable elements and the, the ideas, the how, moving from ed tech to ped tech. In other words, rather than just thinking about the tools, the what and the how, let's now think about the why. Let's take this ped tech approach of being really forensically clear about our pedagogical intentions first, then we choose and use the appropriate technology to support and deliver on that. And that's exactly the sorts of things Graham was talking about earlier. And I know, James, you have um, exactly the same sorts of things happening in your skies. Look at a great example earlier where um, I think learners were accessing QR code based resources specific to their particular needs um, at a point in time. Um, I think it was a maths example I was um, had the privilege of having a look at. And, and that's what it's about. It's about how technology can support meaningful, better learning experiences 
for the young people that we walk with. So yes, very passionate about that. Brilliant. I think we're going to just move the conversation on a little bit more about the strategic implementation of this. Um, Cause I know Graham, you said about coaching and things as well. And so Graham first, then what are then some of those potential challenges that educators might face when implementing technology um, in the classroom and how they can be overcome and I'll start to give you a give you um, a thing to think about. Um, and I I went into school, um, and they had you got one to one devices, but as we've been saying, they had no clear vision. They had no real purpose about what they're doing with them and why they're using them in some ways. And they didn't have a clear digital strategy, and they've just been given devices at the end of the day. And I'm picking that and breaking it down. I went to a lesson. And one of those lessons where they had, there was a white rose mass lesson and they just basically did what they would do traditionally in the exercise books digitally. And I went back at the end of that lesson and asked the teacher, what progress um, did those children make? But I always said, what did the children do? How did you know? And there was no idea of that adaptive teaching and how um, that inclusive tea of some of those pupils who needed it or those extra scaffolding tools that you could use with technology. And so we just broke actually what teaching learning looked like, that ped pedagogical element down into depth. And I think that is also a a concern about if you put devices into a school, it doesn't mean they're going to be used effectively if you haven't got the teacher and learning right in there. Um, and so but then if you have a great teacher who said, well, I've always done it this way, I'm getting the outcome. Actually, are they going to be able to take on another thing and be able to embed it and incorporate it within their practice as well? So, Graham, I'll pass it over to you first. So what are some of those potential challenges and then how may you overcome those? Yeah, so... I think it's fair to say that any sort of change management project in education is different. In fact, not even in education, just is, is different. It's difficult, and I think you know there, there are always going to be challenges. I think that that's the first thing to recognise that actually it's about how we overcome those challenges. So I guess what I'm going to do is focus on the three that I see as being most significant. And the first is around, um, and I think we're we're very good or very bad at doing this, depending on how you look at the situation about not giving trying something but not giving it enough time to really embed you know so we we're going to try a b and c you know that could be about one-to-one -one devices it could be about a new scheme of work it could be about a new kind of leadership structure it could be about new staff structure. it could be you know whatever and we do lots of work generally we're quite good about like training people up and getting them on board and sharing the rationale and doing the the compliance piece but sometimes i think that because we don't see instant results overnight almost we, we move on too quickly and actually for something effective it needs to be embedded and i think it's about having it's about having conviction and having belief and having the knowledge that you know that you have the knowledge as a school to do what's right and and that that won't necessarily happen instantly and i think that that's really really important and i think in terms of technology, that is really, really relevant about, you know, making sure that actually to change the culture, to change what it feels like to be a learner in the classroom takes a lot of time and that doesn't just happen quickly. But if we're going to do that really, really well, then and see the impact on outcomes or engagement in lessons or inclusivity or, or whatever the sort of the end goal is, then we've got to give that time. So the first thing is about, you know, <laughs> Rome wasn't built overnight. Nothing happened quickly. So let's give things time. Second, it's about um and this is this is the obvious one i suppose really about fear of the unknown actually uh in in lots of areas in education the academic literature and research isn't isn't that robust there's you know, there may be some areas of research but actually it's not always quite as specific as we'd like or because it's not necessarily written in our context it's not necessarily deemed to be credible so it's about just uh making sure that we're using research to inform our decision making and recognizing that sometimes we are we are the researchers, and this is something that uh, Fiona and I have sort of been working on something along these lines about saying that you do sometimes just have to instigate that and, and and learn as you go along. But that that kind of knowledge gap, and then the third and final one, I think for me is around um, the financial landscape that we find ourselves in, and and 
and together with that, I suppose, is also the political instability and uh, constraints on staff availability. And actually, I know for lots of senior leaders in education, there's definitely a belief of, you know, I love to do one-to-one devices, but, you know, budgets are looking really tight and we're doing a, you know, a restructure, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so it's about, I think, remaining really strategic about what's really, really important. Um, and, you know, you know, budgets are are nationally a, a real challenge to lots of schools. Um, but just, but kind of, again, coming back to what we said at the start, like sticking to those values, sticking to what your school considers to be really important. And of course, there'll be challenges to overcome, but actually not not deviating away from almost your core values. Fiona, is there anything you want to add? Oh, it's so many things, but <laughs> <laughs> not least of which to ask you both so many questions. Um, what what would be um, what would be a useful point to focus on, James? Otherwise, I'll be jabbering for hours. <laughs> um, what have you seen? What's that perceived? So, I, for my point of view and my perspective at the moment, um, I've talked to academies and schools who have not sat on the fence and just gone whole hog let's incorporate this and actually learning on the job slightly um as graham has put it i've seen schools who have sat on the fence and you've got one or two leaders who are great with it and often the schools that sit on the fence can real really see the um great idea of it but there is a mass perception from one or two and it could be trustees it could be your leaders um and so what are some of those perceived thoughts that s- leaders or schools may have about technology such as they're always going to be on it 100 percent of the time um that you've seen that schools may have overcome or may have actually that, that that's just a thing you're thinking about uh, that actually that doesn't exist mm. no, it's a really good point actually kind of a myth busting um, type question, I guess, isn't it? I mean, take take that point about concerns and it, about students being on devices all the time. We we don't say, oh, I'm really worried that my children in my school might be looking at books all day. We don't have that conversation, do we? Because they don't just stare at a book. They read something, engage and stimulate imagination, or they read something and they find out information, or they read something, they debate it with someone. Again, it's not the thing that they're using, it's what they do with it that is where the impact lies. And I think we need to provoke that kind of forensic precision more when we're talking about digital technology and education is what are they going to do with it? And how does that support and enhance and build on what they could already do elsewhere? And you hear sometimes concern about, um, you know, the amount of hours students spend on on screen time, or you hear this kind of, um, so a case in point last week, there was a UNESCO report that came out and the media focused on, we must ban smartphones in school. And there was a kind of this weird kind of narrative that came out that was kind of almost anti-technology in schools that kind of emerged in the background, which is absolutely nuts because even in the many, many schools I now work with who have a one-to-one laptop or tablet ecosystem for every student, those schools, and, and perhaps you'd share if this is the same for yours, don't have mobile phones in the classroom. They're two totally different things for two totally different purposes. Um, so I think my big thing here would be in every conversation we have, we just need to be a bit more specific. What exactly are we referring to? And what exactly is the perceived issue? Because around technology to support teaching and learning, I think perception can be quite different to the the actual lived reality of our learners. I mean, what what's your take on that, James? I, I from a primary percept, um, perception, completely don't understand the end. Um, phones in a classroom but then I haven't seen it in secondary and why and in in that aspect of it and I think it is going into that precision of that device and what you're doing with it as well so one of the conversations I had with children recently in a school with high PP levels um, very challenging um, demographic in particular so much so their focus on technology has been phenomenal with their SATS results um, over the last 12 months. They've done other bits and pieces, but the use of technology has really supported it. And I was talking to these children, as you always do, and you say, oh, what games do you play online at home and all of those bits? And it comes children, like if you talk to children, and this is going off a bit of a tangent at the moment, 
the two things they like to watch online on YouTube or on kids' YouTube is children is other children playing games and other children opening like games or opening toys. And on like my perception is I don't get it. I, 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 I can't even put myself into their shoes and understand that, that, but that's fine. I, I, I'm aware that's the situation. I'm quite empathetic usually, but in that situation, I don't get it. But what I think a lot of it, and I've been talking about this even more so recently is habits and it's actually stacking habits together so children are like to create they like to play and one of the things about classrooms and schools is we give them the boundaries they know where the line is and they can be creative within that environment so therefore with technology we can do the same things let's give them the tools to go on and give them the digital skills to create videos or do green screening and do those bits and pieces because you'll get children then playing and enhancing and keeping that practicing going and personalizing that learning talking to these children using um doing spelling they're doing some fantastic things with technology with spelling in school they would have played at home that and and done that if the tool was there and accessible to them and i think that feeds really nicely into the culture um for better or for worse at the moment well actually our attention span is so quick and with how things are going if you even look into like Mr. Beast on YouTube, one of the biggest stars out there, it's the first, he says the first five seconds of his video are the most important. And if he doesn't grab the attention, then someone will click off and that's it. Mm. And engagement should be a thing. I, I, but actually given children those tools and given those habits to go through that, I think that's really important. And I think it is a lot of the perception of yes, screen time or well-being is because those people who are asking those questions haven't gone to that granular. And I think in these situations, and I'm thinking back to the change management that we talked about with Graham earlier, um, is you need to see it in other schools, you need to see it in other practices at points, have those discussions, have those open bits, but actually we cannot always sit on the fence. We need to move with this. And I was gone. I was just going to, to kind of reiterate your point, actually, because whether we like it or not all around the world, there are children in classrooms who our our children in our classrooms will be working alongside, working for, having us, you know, in, in their adult lives. And these children are using technologies to make, to fast track, to accelerate, to enhance their learning right now, right here. Today. And we are seeing massive impact on progress, on pace. We're seeing attainment rises. We're be seeing behavioral incidents go down because children are engaged. We're seeing exclusion, exclusion rates go down and attendance go up because children want to be in school. They don't want to miss out. We're seeing learning become more personalized and individualized and therefore individual progress rates accelerate. These are massive, massive things. I hear work with schools where they talk about their GCSE rates being the best they've ever been. You know, we hear about um, disadvantage gaps being being closed, you know, at scale because of certain types of technology use. So the gains to be had are actually really, really significant if we focus on the right things. And I think from a digital sense, it brings about this new form of digital divide. It's not just about whether people have got access to technology and connectivity and devices. It's if children are in a learning environment that uses that purposefully and meaningfully, they are going to have a better education. They are going to have a better trajectory for life. And that's massive. And as teachers, we are the ones that are gatekeeping whether that divide closes or grows over time, which just you know is another way of saying what you've just previously so eloquently put, James. I think we could be here for hours talking about all of this and effective implementation. Um, and I think one of the things kind of just talk around a little bit um, before we really quickly discuss what we think the future could look like or what it should look like, or what we need to do um, is this idea of budgets. And I think money is a huge element in this. Um, and I know if one of my trustees the other day, and I've, I've done a presentation report and um, got them to see it and videos and broken all this misconception that, um, technology that on it all the time that idea of engagement playing and um, giving them facts that over 600,000 questions were answered on these online quizzing platforms over the course of a year and bits and pieces I just put it down to how much does that device then cost um, for these perceived outcomes per month and per year and it is a really tangible thing 
that those from a financial and operation point of view, like, okay, how are we going to actually make sure that investment from a budgetary point of view makes sense and make impact um, from that point of view? Because we don't want to do what we did with the interactive whiteboards from 1997, where we spent uh, one millions and millions, 500 million um, on it with little impact of where that goes, or do the opposite. Um, when 2013, $1.3 billion um, dollars was spent over with about 700,000 devices and one year in of that contract um, with Apple and with the largest school district over there, um, it collapsed and it fell. And actually, it doesn't mean that you have the largest school district who is successful and the largest tech company doesn't equate success. But then we've got to go to the other end of it. And I think one of the conversations that I know we haven't talked about yet, um, and it definitely came in kind of fruition with COVID, is the idea of digital poverty. And the NSPCC put a huge element out there and did uh, some reports recently and said that actually through the pandemic, nearly 500 million school children are unable to access online learning. Um, and if you look at any reports from... World Education Form, um, the World Economic Form, and thinking about skills and jobs for the future, actually just having access to these devices is phenomenal. If I go into London now, I can't actually buy any, I don't have to talk to people. I have to download the app or use the technology to do that. And I, I'm thinking about my parents, uh, my dad who hasn't got a mobile phone, um, so if he goes out, who knows when he's coming back because he hasn't got a phone. Um, no way of contacting, has a paper driving license. Someone like him, how do you then actually access a world that we live in at the moment? And this idea of digital poverty is something really on my forefront thinking at the moment while I'm looking through my work as a leader in our trust. There's another way of flipping that on its head slightly too, isn't there, of if we don't invest in things that can accelerate learning, are we missing a huge impact to improve learning by, by deciding not to make particular investments? It's like building a school and not putting teachers in, isn't it? Definitely, definitely, in terms of that. Um, before I go into uh, my closing question, um, I kind of want to think about what the future could hold. And I'm not going to ask the question, do we need teachers? Because that could be a whole kind of worms. Um, and I, I think we all agree that actually we do need teachers. We need that personalized element. We need the community. Um, and as I said at the beginning, I think what teachers and educators do, we're the orchestra. We are actually conducting and allowing these children to thrive that you'll never be able to do without having that human contact and i think that's a real danger so instead what do you think are you can choose either side of this um and answer it however you want what do you think your predictions of ed tech and technology will be over the next couple of years um and how do you think it will shape it all things that we need to start having conversations about some ways. Graham, I'll start with you, um, especially as in Leo, you have got this one-to-one -one program um, that's been in place for a little bit. And I know you're really diving deep into that at the moment. Yeah, I mean, uh, it, it, it's difficult. And without, without sounding like I'm sitting on the fence, I think that the wider political agenda is clearly incredibly powerful. And, you know, I think the sector has seen exponential, in fact, politics, you know, politics generally, but the education sector has seen such huge change over the last, you know, 10 years, the education system is taken differently. So it's, it's, it, it's a pro and a con, I think. It's exciting to be at this point in education because I think so many things are possible. Um, but it's also quite difficult to think what about what, what might education look like in five years. And then with that in mind, what does that mean for technology? I think... We probably, and Fiona will know far more better than I did the statistics, but I think we're probably seeing more devices in school that have ever been seen. Mm. I think generally uh, people are more aware of the potential that technology has 
although I appreciate that that's not always well defined or articulated what the intent is. Um, and I think there is a real potential that in the future what we'll see is we'll see, you know, and it's not about the number of devices, but we'll see a workforce that is really, really empowered to use technology and has the skills to do that. Um, partly that is what I think we'll see and partly that is what I hope we'll see. Um, but yeah, the, the, the wider political landscape is clearly um, really, really challenging um, at the moment. And then the same to you, Fiona. The future. It's really interesting in this space when we think about um, the future of edtech in this country in particular. There's lots of kind of pause for thought and waiting and inference about general elections and politics. And, and yeah, of course, all of that is important, but it's referred to as the system. And, and Graham, James, we've each talked about this um, before, I know, that the system is us. And actually, if we want things to change, if we want better practices, more improved practices, want greater professional collaboration, then then actually we can make that happen. So, you know, James hosting this radio show, you are doing that. You're spreading these ideas, you're provoking these kinds of thinking, you're making these kinds of discussions increase in, in volume and in quality. Graham does a huge amount, you know, um, regionally, nationally in terms of very generously sharing what is happening at Leo, showing what is possible. And, and this is system leadership. This is showing what can be done and what the positive impact is and how it affects, yeah, all those accountability measures. Yeah, of course, your schools are great schools and ever evolving and ever improving and results are going up and all those brilliant things. But actually, the most important thing of all, in your classrooms, you know, having had the privilege of, of, of working with you both in your classrooms, our learners, who see that school is relevant to them, who want to learn, who want to be there and are learning great things. That system is making that happen and that system is, is you. So in terms of the future, I don't think we should wait for some nameless, faceless politician or policy to, to tell us what to do next. I think we continue to encourage these professional conversations. We continue to show what can be possible. And I think that and the amount and the of that we do and the quality of what we do there that is what will determine the future so eloquently put so um as we wrap up here what's that one piece of advice or what that one last element um that you want to share to our listeners when they are thinking about their use of technology within schools um, what you want them to think about in particular um and I'll start with you, Graham, and then the same question to you, Fiona. Um, mine is oh, <laughs> I'm from the spot here. Mine is uh, you know, don't lose sight of what's really really important. I think you know we spend a lot of time today talking about technology and you know devices and stuff, but you know during during periods of of challenge and adversity that I'm sure we'll all face across the sector is right. You know, remain. Remain human first, remembering that education is fundamentally at the heart of it about connection between people. And that's what uh, that's what's really, really important. Excellent. And you, Fiona? Know thy pedagogy. Get to pedagogy deeper, more forensically. Remember that pedagogy is not just teaching and learning. It's more than that. It's bigger than that. And spend as much time as you can thinking about it, talking about it engaging with all kinds of pedagogical ideas because that will shape not just how we use technology but how we do everything um, as teachers and educators well thank you both for joining me tonight on what has been a fascinating uh, conversation and i know i've just been talking to tom in the background and saying actually this could be a conversation that we went on for hours and hours <laughs> talking about different elements so i definitely want to uh, bring you back and i think we'll have some themes um, in future episodes down the line as well. But thank you once again, Fiona, and thank you once again, Graham, for joining us tonight on Teacher Talk Radio. Don't forget, you can um, follow us and listen back to any of the Teacher Talk Radio shows by downloading the Podbean app or visiting your favourite podcast player and search Teacher Talk Radio. And you can find us also at ttradio.org forward slash listen back. Follow us on Twitter at TT Radio Official and tweet us using the hashtag 
TT Radio. Thank you for listening, and until next time, goodbye. It's time for a fresh start to language learning. Pearson Edexcel's new student-centred French, German and Spanish 2024 GCSEs cater to the needs of all learners, regardless of their background, ability or reason for studying. Rooted in learned language knowledge, their assessments are transparent and accessible, allowing all students to showcase their language skills. Through inclusive and relatable content, the new Pearson Edexcel MFL GCSEs build a shared cultural capital that helps students develop an understanding of and appreciation for the wider world. Find out more at go.pearson.com forward slash MFL GCSE 24. This is Teachers Talk Radio, and this is Teachers Talk Radio News. With exam results looming for students from all four home nations and around the world, Schools Week features an article concentrating on the ongoing impact of the COVID-19 pandemic. The article, written by a head teacher, says we need to continue to consider the additional burden of the pandemic. It reminds us that this year's Year 13s were part of a cohort who didn't sit GCSE exams, and that this year's Year 11s were in Year 8 when lockdowns began, although the start of GCSE was supposed to be a return to normal for these students. Teachers too faced the challenge of a return to normal content, having had it reduced over the last two years. ECTs also needed some increased support in delivering the broader content for a number of GCSEs. Workload for pupils and teachers shifted and perhaps increased as schools tried to find the right balance of support, revision and basic content coverage by often offering after school and holiday intervention sessions. Whatever happens for individuals on results days this year, the ghost of the pandemic, he says, has not disappeared just yet. The Guardian reports on new local government association research, which suggests council-maintained schools in England outperform academies in Ofsted ratings. The research found 93% of council-maintained schools were ranked good or outstanding by Ofsted as of the 31st of January 2023. This compared with 87% of academies that have been graded since they converted. The study also found only 57% of academies that were already an academy in August 2018 managed to improve standards from inadequate or requires improvement to good or outstanding, compared with 73% of council-maintained schools. The research has prompted many to question the evidence for a move away from council-maintained schools. Currently, 80% of secondary schools and 40% of primaries are academies. Councils were last able to open maintained schools in 2012. A Department for Education spokesperson said academy reforms have played a major role in increasing the proportion of good or outstanding schools. Education Union said allowing local authorities to open new maintained schools would boost the ability to respond to demographic changes by opening quality provision. Whilst the research has been seen by many as a warning about the risks of government policy on academisation, some have pointed out that because schools who are failing are required to convert to academies, the numbers are always going to be skewed. A report by the Children's Commissioner shows that eating disorders such as bulimia, anorexia and binge eating are on the rise in England. Figures suggest that in the UK an estimated 1.25 million have an eating disorder but that young people under the age of 25 are disproportionately affected. The report points to NHS figures which it says show a large and recent increase in the numbers of hospital admissions for young people due to eating disorders, with almost half being for those under 25. Whilst the large majority of those affected are female, admissions of young men have more than doubled in the period from 2015-16 to 2020-21. However, according to the report, whilst the number of children and young people starting treatment has more than doubled, so have waiting times for the beginning of treatment. Urgent cases now take more than 12 weeks to begin. The report suggests that government need to tackle some of the drivers of disordered eating, including online content and forms of social media. In the USA, the Education Secretary, Miguel Cardona, says the Supreme Court decision to eliminate affirmative action 
may help to axe legacy and donor-based college admissions. The Guardian covers the story which focuses on the college admissions process across America. The wealthiest Americans, who are overwhelmingly white, benefit disproportionately from college admissions based on familial relations with alumni and school donors. Cardona praised colleges who have already stopped legacy admissions, including Wesleyan University, Johns Hopkins and Massachusetts Institute of Technology. He said these and other schools were making sure they're doing more for diversity than they were doing before the end of affirmative action. He did, however, make his criticism of the decision by the Supreme Court clear when he said that there are brown and black kids who are going to feel like they're not wanted. This has been your Teachers Talk Radio News with Joe Fox. You've been listening to Teachers Talk Radio. Tune in live and listen back at ttradio.org. We look forward to hearing from you next time on Teachers Talk Radio.